Hey guys, welcome back to another Q&A. My last one was way more successful than I expected. So I put some feelers out there and you guys sent me more questions. You sent me some really, really good ones and I'm excited to get into these. So let's just jump right in. I'm going to do the questions for my Patreon members first because you guys I am the most loyal to. You are the ones who are after all financially supporting me and my podcast. So I want to give a big shout out to you guys and tell you how much I appreciate you. And if you want to be a part of our little Patreon family, you can go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered and join. All right, so my first question is from Pickle Pick from Patreon. He says, what do you like to read? I'm a literary fiction fan myself, mostly current fiction, but with a good dose of Victorian novels. Next to photography, literature has always been my biggest passion. I actually was considering becoming an English teacher before I got roped into the porn industry. So it's something that I love. I have to admit, I don't read nearly as much as I used to, but I very much still appreciate some good prose. Uh, my favorite author of all time, I have to say, is Ernest Hemingway. I just love um, the way that he moves dialogue along. I love the fact that it's dialogue that fuels the stories. He's not incredibly descriptive in many senses of the word, but um, he's just an amazing writer and I love his stories. My favorite book is The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. I used to identify very much so with the main character, Brett. Um, she was an alcoholic, which many of you know I used to be, and uh, she was a man-eater, which I used to consider myself, but of course I no longer am that at all. But uh, yeah, so that's my favorite book. Otherwise, I love the Bronte sisters. I love Jane Austen. I also love Paul Bowles. Um, the Sheltering Sky is one of my favorite books of all time. So I have a pretty wide, range of stuff that I like to read, but mostly fiction for sure. Jabberwock from Patreon says, I think that an explanation of what goes on from when the performers arrive on set to when they leave would go a long way for those of us not in the industry, understanding what a business this really is and the work required to produce a 30 minute clip or a feature length movie. So he's referring to the few times, only a few times that I've griped about like really long days, like, you know, I have 18 hour days, a 12 hour day is not uncommon. And he's wondering what, you know, goes into such long days. So generally like an 18 hour day would almost always be for a feature movie, though I did have a 16 hour day for a one scene situation for Digital Playground. That one was complicated because we were doing a lot of special effects and there was, um, it was basically that whole look where everything's black and white except for key um, colors like lips and, and uh, heels and stuff like that. And so you actually had to make those green in order for, because um, you had to green screen them so that later on the editor could paint them in red. But then we also had to shoot part of the scene in regular color because it was like a flashback situation. So we would have to go from like red lips to green lips green shoes to red shoes back and forth. And then we had someone get shot and we had to have like exploding blood, which like didn't work the first time. And it got the shirt wet and um, bloody. And I had to like clean it and dry it. It was like a whole thing. So there's so many things that can come into play that can make a day really long. Um, I will say that makeup and hair generally takes about two hours per person. So especially if you have multiple girls on set, that's going to add to your day. Um, the lighting can take quite a while depending on whether or not it's particularly complicated. Also, I like to usually light my sets differently for stills than I do for video. So I'll generally use strobes for the photo sets and then I'll switch it out to video lights or continuous lights for the video. And so that's two lighting setups and breakdowns just for one scenario. So that also takes time. Uh, dialogue can take a really long time, especially if there's tricky shots in there or the performers can't remember their lines. There's also that as well. And just the general things that can happen that will make production last longer. Sound issues can definitely be a thing. Sometimes if you're shooting, I don't know, in the city, there'll be like a helicopter that's circling the area. You gotta stop and wait for that to go away. 
Uh, maybe there's construction going on next door that you have to wait for them to stop, planes going overhead. Um, there's just so many different things that can make a day go long. And, um, you know, generally it's just the setups of all the different areas. Like if I get a script where there's a lot of different sequences of shots that I have to get in different areas of the house, um, you know, over the shoulder of one performer and then over the shoulder of another performer, it's going to take me a while to do every single one of those because I have to set up and move lights for every single one of those shots. So it all adds up. Okay, Chris H. from Patreon asks, how do you plan to expose or let your child know what you do for a living and all that you're involved in? Obviously, you're the child of Suze Randall, but times are different. And do you plan to do things differently than how you were raised? That's a great question. And uh, <laughs> I'm, so I'm of two minds about it. First of all, I'm not terribly worried about it because obviously I was raised by parents who worked in the adult industry and I think I turned out okay. I think we all turned out okay. I have two other siblings, one's a lawyer and one's a nurse. So, you know, they never ended up working in the adult industry and they don't have a problem with it. I think honestly, as long as you raise your child with good values, with a lot of love and honesty, um, it doesn't really matter what you do for a living. My parents never hid what they did from me. For when I was a child, my understanding was mommy and daddy make movies and take pictures for grown-ups, and I'm not a grown-up, so I'm not allowed to look at it. And that was kind of like the extent of that. Now, obviously when I became a teenager and hit puberty, I became a little bit more interested in what they did for a living, but they were never ashamed of what they did. They didn't teach me the shame that a lot of parents teach their children around sex and around the naked human body. So I feel that honestly, I grew up with a healthier understanding of sex than most people did. And that's what I plan to raise my child with as well. And my husband agrees. Um, now in terms of the content that out, that's out there, there's definitely a big difference between when I used to sneak into the office when I was, you know, uh, going through puberty and steal a couple of penthouse magazines where everything in there was like really soft core because you couldn't actually even shoot penetration in scenes in photo sets back in the day that went in magazines because different states and especially Canada which was a big market had all of these rules all that changed when the internet came along but that's a whole different story and then obviously now where you can go online and there's tons of free tube sites that are showing all kinds of content so um you know, I'm going to tackle that problem when I get to it. My child hasn't even been born yet. And by the time she's of age to go on the internet and to find that kind of stuff, things might be different, you know, um, maybe more things will be behind a paywall or restricted or our method of accessing the internet will be completely different. Anyhow, technology is changing so quickly. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to worry about that too much until we get to that stage and then I'll figure it out from there. But, um, it's not something that keeps me up at night, to be honest. Corey asks, Holly, you run photography workshops. Would you consider a modeling workshop explaining to regular women like me how to pose the tips and the tricks from professional photography to selfies? So I was in the midst of building a photography course like several different courses that I was going to market and then quarantine hit and I got pregnant. <laughs> so uh, that kind of put the brakes on my project, but I was definitely going to have posing in there. It was going to be, I was going to angle it more for the photographer, but I think that it's something that would definitely work for models as well. I think they could also learn a lot from it because I do think that posing is really important and I do think it's something I'm good at and I think it's kind of a lost art. You know, I was, I came up in a time when photos were the most important thing. You know, I was shooting for magazines. The bandwidth connections online weren't very fast and so video wasn't something that people consumed a lot of because it just took so long to download video. You could not stream it back then. So photos were a big thing. So I was very much taught the art of photography and posing um, for many, many years when I first started. And I'm very grateful for that education. And I think that that's something that's lacking in a lot of 
photographers' repertoires these days. Also, to be fair, the photos aren't as important as the video anymore, so not as much time is spent on it, not as much focus is on it, so people generally don't really care about it as much. So um, I do think it's a bit of a lost art. But yes, that is something I hopefully will be able to do sometime in the future after I get back on more of a schedule. Edward from Ireland asks, what kind of music or TV shows or movies do you like? What kind of books do you like to read? So I already answered the book question. Um, I, I love horror movies. I'm really into horror movies. Um, it's weird. They don't really freak me out that much. It's very difficult to find a movie that scares me, but a good horror movie is, is just, uh, is just a wonderful thing to indulge in. I'm a big fan. You know, I also like comedies. I'm not really into chick flicks. I'll be honest. I very rarely watch chick flicks unless it's a period piece. I love period pieces. I'm very much an Anglophile. So anything that's set in 18th century, 17th century, 16th century England, like I'm all about it. I love that kind of stuff. In terms of TV shows, you know, um, I just like anything that's good. I really enjoyed Narcos. We just started watching Ozarks, which is really good. I love what we do in the shadows. That is one of my favorite shows. It's so funny. I'm so sad the season just ended. So, um, you know, my, my tastes are pretty eclectic. I just like something that's well written and well done. Oh, and obviously Game of Thrones, like my favorite movie, my favorite movie, my favorite TV show of all time. I named my freaking dog Khaleesi. So clearly uh, that's a TV show that I was really hooked on. In terms of music, I'm a big fan of classic rock. Uh, Led Zeppelin is my favorite band of all time. Um, I also love blues. I also love um, like Billie Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, Louis Armstrong. I love like New Orleans jazz, um, ambient music. Um, what do they call it? Trip hop. I love Portishead, Massive Attack. Um, I mean, you know, honestly, a lot of different kinds of music, some pop songs for sure, especially like for working out. Um, I will say that I don't enjoy death metal and um, I don't generally enjoy country, but my husband loves country and he plays it a lot and uh, I often have to suffer through that. So I find that uh, my tolerance for country is better than it used to be. Corey asks, how long have you been a director in the industry? So. I've been working in the industry behind the scenes for 22 years. It'll be 22 years specifically this September. Um, I was doing just photography for a large chunk of that because like I mentioned before, back in the day, video online at least was not nearly as prevalent as photos because the bandwidth just didn't support the ability to be able to consume videos. So there was a lot of demand for photos with magazines obviously still being really um, significant so I was really just a photographer for the most part and then towards oh, I don't know maybe 2006 or something like that 2007 I started recognizing much to the detriment of not detriment but I started recognizing that video was becoming more and more important. And this was actually a place that my mother and I clashed on a lot because she just wanted to shoot photos. That was her thing. And I could see that video was going to take over the industry. So we used to fight about that a lot. Um, I just basically picked up a video camera and taught myself how to shoot video. Um, having no idea what I was doing, I would just try to learn from other people, um, trial and error. So obviously now video is more important than photos. So I would say like solidly directing, I've been doing that for probably five, six years or something like that. I have a really bad sense of time, so I'm not 100% sure, but something like that. I still feel like, I'm still honestly a photographer at heart. Um, that's really my main passion and directing is something that I enjoy, but I still feel like it's kind of something that I still, I'm still learning, you know? Okay, so my next question comes from Chand. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name. 
So this question was the one that sent me down quite a rabbit hole where I researched and learned some really interesting things about India and porn, but let's read his question first. So he says, does India or South Asia have an impact on the American porn industry? Like, do they consider India when they talk about their audience? So I went online, did a little bit of research because I thought that porn was actually illegal to consume in India. Like I knew it was illegal to create, but I thought they also weren't allowed to watch it as well. And that's not technically true. So let me read to you what uh, I discovered. I just pulled excerpts from yourstory.com and India Today. So India accounts for the world's third largest consumer base at Pornhub. Pornhub is kind of a good uh, base to look at, uh, you know, user statistics on porn because obviously it's the biggest porn site in the world and it's free. So pretty much everybody goes to Pornhub. So between 2013 and 2017, India's porn traffic recorded the highest growth globally um, at 121%. They were ahead of Japan, Canada, the US and the UK. Now this just is in terms of growth. This is not in terms of overall users. The US is still the number one consumer of porn. And then I believe UK is number two, but India is number three and growing faster than everybody else. So Pornhub attributes this to the availability of inexpensive and unlimited cellular plans, which not only led to a porn boom, but also resulted in viewing shift from laptops and desktops to mobiles. So I think that that's pretty common overall. We all know that porn is still like everybody's dirty little secret. So it's much easier to sneak in a little naughty viewing party on your phone than it is on your laptop or on your computer. You know, you can like watch it in the bathroom with headphones at work or wherever you do your thing. So that makes sense to me. Um, now the Indian government wants to ban adult content on the web. Uh, the high court in late September of last year mandated that the Department of Telecom or DOT uh, must issue a ban on 827 adult content websites. Of course, in that list of websites was Pornhub. Um, on October 25th, Reliance Geo, sorry again if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, the country's fastest growing cellular network, followed DOT's order and was the first ISP to block porn sites, including Pornhub and X videos, among others. However, Many porn users in India have been able to bypass this by using VPN and other various methods. In fact, Google Trends data shows VPN searches from India have doubled in the October 27th to November 3rd week, the week literally right after the ban. So they banned it and then like all these people in India figured a way to get around it using a VPN to the point where that number doubled in just a week. So you Indians are resourceful people, I must say. So, however, as I mentioned before, viewing porn is actually not technically illegal in India. Um, so despite these bans that were instituted by various ISPs at the behest of DOT, the government is not proactively banning watching porn in India. In India, watching pornography in private is not illegal, though, of course, watching or accessing child pornography is like it is here and I think in almost every country. However, producing pornographic content or distributing it, like I suppose via DVD or magazine, is illegal in India. So, to answer your question, I know that MindGeek, who owns Pornhub and also owns Twisties, the main site that I shoot for, I know that they consider trends overall that they see on Pornhub. Um, and considering that India is the third largest market for porn, um, obviously automatically whatever trends they're exhibiting shows up in on Pornhub and is considered by the people at MindGeek and I think um, at a lot of other companies. So though we don't explicitly like sit down and say like, okay, what can we do that will attract Indian audiences? Obviously, they have a heavy influence overall on what we decide to shoot. So I would say, yes, they definitely influence um, how we shoot porn, 
but again, maybe not explicitly so. Anyways, I thought that was a really interesting question, led me to uh, pick up some interesting research, so thank you very much for asking that. Oh, and I forgot to mention, um, the last part of your question was to get Sunny Leone on my podcast. Um, I love Sunny. We are friendly. We are friends. Um, I've actually done some mainstream work for her um, since she's become such a big star in Bollywood, but she's very careful with her image, especially considering her past an adult. And so it's just not a good choice for her PR wise to come on and do my show. So I did ask and um, she did decline, but for no personal reasons. And I certainly don't take it personally. I love Sunny. I'm very happy for her success and I wish her all the best. Okay. So that's all the questions that I have. Thank you guys so much for sending them in. I got some really good ones. Um, make sure that you send me more. I'd love to do more of these. Um, these Q and A's seem to be pretty popular and I guess you guys enjoy them and I enjoyed doing them. So thank you very much. Also, thank you for watching and supporting my podcast by watching my YouTube videos. I hope you've subscribed. If you haven't, you definitely should because then you'll never miss an episode or a new highlight clip or a live show. I've been doing all these live um, chats with uh, various porn stars called uh, Quarantine Chat. So that's been really fun. And if you're maybe a more proactive supporter, maybe you're a member of my Patreon, I just wanna thank you so much for that. I couldn't do this show without you guys, you're awesome. And if you aren't a member of my Patreon, maybe you should consider checking it out. Go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered where you get early access and live access to my interviews. Also, you get exclusive Q and A's that I only post on my Patreon platform. And that is with um, various models that I interview, like I did one recently with Abella Danger and Alex Lynx, Ginger Lynn. And uh, these are exclusive only to my Patreon members. I also have my exclusive podcast that I do with Eva, my LA porn life. There's so much more at my Patreon that um, I think makes a subscription worth it. So I hope you'll go check it out. Thank you guys so much for joining me and I'll see you next time.